Previously at New Life Church. If, if Abram hadn't lied in the first place and trusted God, this, this poor woman, Sarah uh, Hagar, may never have been brought into the picture. So you think something happens now in your life and it's over. No, there can be ripple effects. Tell me if I'm right. There can be ripple effects years later for choices that you make today, 20 years from now. I don't know, do you think Abraham had, any, Abram had any responsibility to Hagar? I feel like he did. So instead of protecting Hagar, 
as much hot water as that would have gotten in with Sarai, he says, hey, she's your, she's your servant, do whatever you want to do. So I, I feel bad. I feel bad in this story for Hagar. I think, I think you know, I hate to say victim because we victimize everything today. But I feel like she, she, had, she had all these things going. But you know what? God's still in the equation. She, God's still watching over her. And, and he so, shows himself faithful to Hagar. God sees what's going on. God knows what's going on. I tell this to people all the time, parents, and, I, and it's hard living this when you have kids yourself. But I've said this to parents uh, a thousand times. The, their kids went sideways, they're off the rail, they're messed up, they're in jail, they're doing drugs, they're, whatever the case might be. And I'll say, listen, here's the only thing I can say to comfort you, but it's a good comfort. The comfort is this, God loves your children more than you do, and God has a plan for their life. And that, that's always good advice, except it's hard for me sometimes to see that. And it's hard for anybody to see it, right? Because when you're in the middle of the storm, you're like, when, how's this gonna end? You know, there's no happy ending here. I don't see a happy ending. There, but God, again, God sees, God hears. He's never abandoning you. And so if you're, if you're in difficult circumstances, God sees. If you're in pain, God sees. If others are attacking you, God sees. Previously at New Life Church. If, if Abram hadn't lied in the first place and trusted God, this, this poor woman, Sarah uh, Hagar, may never have been brought into the picture. So you think something happens now in your life and it's over. No, there can be ripple effects. Tell me if I'm right. There can be ripple effects years later for choices that you make today, 20 years from now. I don't know. Do you think Abraham had any, Abram had any responsibility to Hagar? I feel like he did. So instead of protecting Hagar, as much hot water as that would have gotten in with Sarai, he says, hey, she's your, she's your servant. Do whatever you want to do. So I, I feel bad. I feel bad in this story for Hagar. I think, I think you know, I hate to say victim because we victimize everything today. But I feel like she, she, had, she had all these things going. But you know what? God's still in the equation. She, God's, God's still watching over her. And, and, and he, he so, shows, shows himself faithful to Hagar. God, God sees what's, what's going on. God, God knows what's going on. on. I, I tell this, this to people all the time, parents, and, I, and it's hard living this when you, when you have, have kids yourself. yourself. But I've, I've said, said this to parents a, a thousand times. times. The, their kids, kids went sideways, they're, they're off the rail, rail they're messed up, they're in jail, they're doing drugs, whatever the case might be. And I'll say, listen, Here's the only thing I can say to comfort you, but it's a good comfort. The comfort is this. God loves your children more than you do, and God has a plan for their life. And that, that's always good advice, except it's hard for me sometimes to see that. And it's hard for anybody to see it, right? Because when you're in the middle of the storm, you're like, when, how's this gonna end? You know, there's no happy ending here. I don't see a happy ending. There, but God, again, God sees, God hears. He's never abandoning you. And so if you're, if you're, if you're in, in difficult, difficult circumstances, circumstances, God sees. If you're in pain, God, God sees. sees. If, if others, others are attacking you, God sees. All right. Good morning, church. Good morning. <clears throat> oh, that's pretty, pretty perky for an hour less sleep. That's good. Don't you hate this time change thing? Wouldn't it be better if they just had one time and left it alone? I, I think so. That's my, my vote, but they, don't, they didn't ask me. Um, welcome to Life Church. Glad that you're here, particularly if it's your first time or second time. We're thrilled that you're here. We do want to ask you to please take that tear-off flap on your bulletin. We call it the connection card. Bring it to the information table out in the, uh, in the lobby, and uh, you know, you're going to get a great gift. Uh, first time gift is going to be really good. Second time gift is good. You're going to enjoy it. And we want to just uh, be able to keep record of your attendance with us today. Uh, I want to share uh, condolences and ask for your prayers for two families. Uh, Donna Giuliano, Donna and Phil Giuliano. Donna's dad died um, on Friday, I think. And, uh, and that's always tough to, to lose somebody that you love. And then uh, Jenna... Brodeur, Jenna and Eric Brodeur, her dad died yesterday morning. So uh, keep the families in prayer, and um, we'll, we'll release information on arrangements as soon as, as soon as we get them 
for you because I know the families appreciate it when their church family shows up if there's calling hours or you know funeral, and it means a lot. It means a lot to them. All right, uh, we're going to take a break this morning <clears throat> from the uh, All In series with Abraham. We're going to come back to it next week with a dramatic, perhaps one of the most dramatic stories in the Bible next week, and certainly in Abraham's life next week, so don't miss next week. But this is a, a change of pace, and it's, it's, a, it's a bittersweet Sunday. Um, back in 2000, 2006, we were part of a merger. Church in Meriden, Calvary Baptist Church merged with, with us, and um, that was, a, that was a, a challenge all in itself. There was no uh, book on church mergers. Nobody told you how to do it. And it had, uh, there were some, some rough waters. But one of the good things that came out of it, we inherited some really wonderful families during that uh, time. And, and none better than Pastor Chris Shelby, Luke, Andrew Belmare, the best, uh, best of the best. And they have been uh, extremely loyal, faithful, serving at every turn, many capacities. But God's called them somewhere else. And I, and I, and I mean that when I say God's called them. Because you, if you know all the details about this, you can see God's hand is on every step of this uh, change. And so uh, we've got a little video for you to watch this morning. So if we can get the lights, please. Um, and keep, keep the laughter down, if you would, please. Keep the laughter down. <laughs> Let's get the lights and let's go to the video. And we'll have, um, we'll have more Friday, this coming Friday night, 6 to 8. We're going to have an open house celebration with the Belmares. And we'll have more, uh, more pics, more video. It'll be a fun time here Friday night, uh, 6 o'clock. Um, and that one picture, don't remember, the merger was almost 18 years ago. So obviously, Pastor Chris looked much, I look exactly the same. But Pastor Chris looked much younger 18 years ago. He, the, I've, I've aged him horribly. So uh, I've asked him to speak today. So let's give a warm welcome for Pastor Chris. I'm not going to cry. <laughs> you know, I have been so honored to be a part of this church. One of the most amazing thing, God has been so good to me and my family, and you, you don't know the half of it, but one of the biggest blessings in my life was for the merger and to be part of New Life Church for Pastor, no, <laughs> for Pastor Will to be my boss, and the growth that I've experienced under his leadership, and it's, it's just been such amazing. I, I wouldn't be where I am in my life without Pastor Will, and so I'm so thankful. I'm thankful for the opportunities that he's giving me to preach and lead. It's not easy giving up the pulpit. It's not easy. You know, preachers love to preach. I love to preach, so I'll, I'll be getting to do that a lot more now. You know, I was thinking, I preached many, many times, I don't know, dozens of times here at New Life Church, and I had to think about what is something, what is like the thing that I want to leave the people with? And out of all the lessons I've learned in my life and the things that I've learned about God and my relationship and my walk with Him, 
And I was thinking back to my early years, my early faith. I was led to Christ by my wife. She missionary dated me, which means, you know, she dated me hoping that I would become a Christian. It took about five, six months, but it worked. Good job. I'm glad she did. I don't recommend it, but, you know, date Christians. That's what I would say first, but, you know. Anyway, um, you know, but I, I had a lot of spiritual baggage in my life. And she went to Calvary Baptist Church, and I went to another church that had basically a false religious belief system. And I was really like stuck in those beliefs, and I had a lot of struggles with going to church. And my beliefs that way started to change, and I started to realize they were false beliefs and everything. But um, she always wanted me to go to church, and she was, you know, always pushing me to go to church, and I just didn't want to go to church. I, I don't know what was wrong with me, but I would go probably once a month to church with her, which obviously it caused a lot of friction and difficulties in our marriage among a lot of other things. If you know my marriage testimony, that's another story for another time, but I just didn't want to go to church. The moment I would sit in the back row, no offense, if you're in the back, you're good. Hi, John. Uh, Yeah. Uh, But I would always sit in the back, and the moment church was over, boom, I was like right out the back door, Shelby, let's not talk to anybody. And she probably, like, she wanted to stay and converse and things like that, but I just, I I wanted to be out. And I would make excuses not to go to church. I would purposely stay up late playing video games, so I was too tired to go to church in the morning. If I had any little tinge of discomfort, I'm sick, I can't go to church today. And I didn't realize, and then everything in my life my finances, she always reminds me to say this was 25, 20, it was a long time ago, years, decades ago. Ooh, that sounds really old. <laughs> and yeah, of course, yeah, we haven't aged. I could see like my beard and then I see my belly growing and shrinking as I go through these weight loss <laughs> things over the years. Um, but she always wanted me to go to church and I, I didn't want to go to church and it caused a lot of friction in our marriage. My marriage was failing. We basically just grew to hate each other. My finances were an absolute disaster. Even though I didn't give anything to the church, it was my own financial mismanagement that caused us to have a bankruptcy. Our house was foreclosed on in the first two years of our marriage. We hated each other and we wanted a divorce. Everything I was doing in my own intelligence and my own power was an absolute dumpster fire. It was terrible. And I hit rock bottom. We hit rock bottom. It was, it was a disaster. Um, and uh, we went through three sets of marriage counseling with pastors, Shoreline Christian Counseling. Ultimately, what changed the way that we thought was a couple in our church, Bob and Barbara Westendorf, who still go here, suggested and helped us be able to go, because our finances were a disaster too, to an event called Weekend to Remember by Family Life, which I could not recommend. If you are getting married, Andrew and Mason, if you're here, if you're getting married surprise. If you're getting married, I couldn't recommend more going to Weekend to Remember because what it did was it changed the way that we built our marriage. We built our marriage, all of our ideals were based on what the world says what a marriage should be and they weren't based on what God said marriage should be. And so that we got those kind of results from it. But Weekend to Remember transformed the way that we thought about marriage. It transformed the way that I thought about my role as a husband and her as her role as a wife and that God made marriage and God made marriage to be something wonderful and beautiful and exciting. And no, it's not perfect, but it is so good when we do it the way that God said to do it. And it's so bad when we don't. And Satan hates marriage, so he does everything he can. He throws everything he can at it to break it up. And when God saved our marriage, like after that, our our minds, our lives were transformed. And there was something in me that said, man, God knows what he's talking about in the Bible. And I just had a passion. I, I was so thankful for what he did in my life, that he gave me a wife, that he gave me beautiful children, that you couldn't keep me out of church. I loved coming to church. And so my goal is that you realize how important the church is to God and how important our role is within the church, how important it is for us to go to church and be a part of the church and that we don't waste our lives not prioritizing because God prioritizes the church and that we don't waste our lives, we don't waste a Sunday, we don't waste a moment during the week to be plugged in and to be part of what God is doing and God's plan for this dark and hurting world. 
because I don't think we understand that. The word for church in the Bible is ecclesia in the Greek, and sometimes it refers to the universal church, all believers of all times and all places of the world. But most of the time, the church, when it says ecclesia, it's referring to the local church, the group of body of believers, in this case, New Life Church right here in Wallingford, Connecticut, or Meriden, depending on where you're standing. <laughs> and, and so we're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses 12 and 27. And just to give you a little context, 1 Corinthians is talking about spiritual gifts. Paul is tra- wanting the church not to be ignorant about the gifts that God has given them because they were abusing the gifts and they were using the gifts in the wrong way. And so he's talking about spiritual gifts in the body. In verse 12, he says, The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. And then in verse 27, he says, All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for the privilege, for the honor of being part of your church, God, to be a part of what you are doing, your hands and feet in this dark and hurting world, God. I pray that you change the way we think, that you help us to be all in for what you are all in for, the church, in this case right here, New Life Church, God. I pray that you, anything, any priority that we're putting ahead of, out of place or where it should be, God, I help. I pray that you help us to think the way you think about the church and that our lives, the way we live, the way uh, our actions, that we can demonstrate that we are all in for the church. So we just love you. We praise you. Help me not to cry in Jesus' name. Amen. (laughs) All right. So Paul's talking about spiritual gifts. He says all of us have a spiritual gift. When you put your faith in Jesus, you get the Holy Spirit. You get all of the Holy Spirit, not just a part of the Holy Spirit. And God gives you a spiritual gift, at least one. And he says not everybody has the same gift. And the purpose of spiritual gifts is to edify, to build up the body of Christ. So we all have gifts, we all have gifts and he compares it to a human body. So my body has an arm, my body has eyes, your body has arms, I, well, you know, and some of us have disabilities, but a fully functioning and optimal human body has all the parts and they're all working and they all have a specific role. My eye is not trying to grab things, hopefully, or my hands aren't trying to see or my ears aren't trying to speak. So all of our body has many parts the same way, he says, as the church. The church has many parts and all of those parts are necessary. That means point number one, the church is the body of Christ and you are a vital part of it. You are a vital part of this church, New Life Church. We are the body of Christ. That's not just something we have to do, being part of the church, being part of the body of Christ. I mean, the body of Christ. Jesus called us his body. In fact, in Ephesians, yeah, I don't have that in my notes, but Ephesians chapter 5 talks about marriage and the oneness and the unity of a husband and wife, and he says, I'm talking about Christ and the church. So all of us has a role. All of us has something to do. God has equipped us with a spiritual gift. Well, how do I know what my spiritual gift is? How do I know what my role is in the church? Try stuff. When my wife and I started going to Calvary Baptist Church, this lady, uh, Pat Coons, some of you know who she is, she asked us to help with uh, teens in Sunday school. And we said no. We, we didn't know anything about teens, didn't really like teens, especially the ones that were in, some of that, in that group at the time. And then a couple ladies, a couple ladies asked us to, Zach, you weren't there yet, don't worry. A couple uh, ladies asked us to help with middle school youth ministry. And we were like, all right, we've got to, we'll try something. And so we started doing middle school youth ministry. We got involved. And we ended up not being sure, not feeling like we're really connecting with the kids. There were only seven kids at the time. Not feeling like we're really connecting. And then they asked us to go on a winter retreat with the kids. We went on this winter retreat, and Shelby and I said, you know what, if we don't feel it after this, we're going to quit. And if we do, you know, God will reveal it to us in this. We went on this winter retreat. Everything went wrong. This girl was throwing up Swedish fish in Shelby's room like the whole night. I, I, I I, I won't spend a lot of time. It was just a disaster. We got back, Shelby and I never had a chance to talk the whole retreat. When we get back, the kids get picked up. We're both like, we know the other one is going to say, yeah, forget it. We look at each other and we were like, we loved it. (laughs) It was awesome. 
And that was the start of, well, 22, I don't know how many years uh, doing youth ministry. It's just, it was such a blessing. Guys, if you are not plugged in, if you don't understand that you are part of this body, that you have a role to play, that you have a part to play, you're missing out. You don't know how. Try something. Try serving at the Grace Place. Uh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So the church is, uh, you're a vital part of the body of Christ. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 6 through 11. We just talked about that in the Antioch class yesterday, this passage. It says, and this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading the good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people because Paul persecuted the church, he says, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose, this, listen to this, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. God wanted people to use the church to reveal who he is. Yes, he uses individual believers. The church is not a building. The church is people. You are the church if you are a follower of Jesus and you put your faith in him. But he uses us together. He uses us in community. That's the most powerful way he uses us. And so point number two is the church reveals God's wisdom to the world. The church reveals God's wisdom to the world. When the world wants to know what is God like, they have to look at the church. Think of all the one another's in the Bible. I think of John 13, 35. By this, the world will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Who is the one another? If you're a Lone Ranger Christian, oh, I can just have my own private relationship with God. I just got me and my Bible. Uh, that's not good enough. You're not being the church. You're not being part of the church. You're, not, you're, disobeying, you're being a disobedient believer. And so people, they want to know who God is, and the church tells them the way that we care for one another, the way that we love one another, the way that we serve one another. If you go back to the very early church, I don't have Acts 2, 42 to 47 memorized, but after Peter preaches this powerful sermon, 3,000 people put their faith in Jesus, or it may be more than that, 3,000 at least put their faith in Jesus, they get baptized, and that's the beginning of the first church. And they met together, they broke bread together, they ate together, they prayed for one another, they taught the scriptures, um, they did all these things, they shared the Lord's Supper together, they did all the things that the church does and when they saw this, they sold everything they owned. We're not saying that, just half is good. No, they sold that. This is, this is their context. It's not normative. It's saying, you know, every church has to be like this. But they sold everything they owned. They give it to the poor. They, anybody that had a need, they met that need. That's what the church does when there are needs. We care for one another. And when people saw this, it said, and more people were being added to their number daily. They saw the love. They saw the community. They saw what people in the church experienced that nobody in any kind of social club could ever experience, and they were drawn to that. Are we drawing people to the church by our love for one another? We live in such a confused, dark world. We have to be the light. And we're the light when we come together as the church. The universe, when we want to know, who, people want to know who God is, uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 20, it says that his uh, divine power and his, his eternal nature have been revealed through his creation. So no one has an excuse for saying God doesn't exist. So when they want to see, yes, God exists, they can look at nature. But they, when they want to see his character, when they want to see his wisdom, they look at the church. Let's go on to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. He says, I am writing these things to you now, even though I hope to be with you soon, so that if I am delayed, you will know how people must conduct themselves in the household of God. This is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and the foundation of the truth. And so Paul is writing to Timothy. First and second Timothy and Titus are called the pastoral epistles. And they're called that because he's basically telling them, uh, Timothy was in Ephesus, 
uh, Titus was in Crete, he left them there to help establish the churches that he had planted there. And then he writes them letters to tell them this is how the church operates. That's why we have elders at our church. We look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Titus chapter 1. It tells you this is how a church should be run. And he's giving them instructions, and then he's telling him what the church is, that the church is the pillar and the foundation of the truth. And if you think, I mean, maybe there was a time, I've only been alive for 49 years, but I can't think back in a time and even studying history when truth was more under attack than today. When fundamental realities that we've agreed on for, 6, year, for thousands of years, you know, have, are all of a sudden in the last week <laughs> under attack that people are denying things that are just absolutely obvious and coming up with the craziest convoluted stories and theories and ideologies to attack these things. I mean, to say, to go back to kindergarten cop. All right, some of you may know what I'm saying. Boys have certain parts. Girls have certain parts. You know, this boy said this to embarrass Arnold Schwarzenegger, but there were things, at, nobody would deny that. Nobody would. All of these crazy gender ideology came about like a few years ago. It had a long development period uh, back from the, in the 50s and 60s. But it came out very recently, and all of a sudden, everybody's like, oh, yeah, of course. But it's, it's based on a lie. Because where do we go? How do we know what's true? Do we just observe reality? Do we look through a telescope or a microscope? Those can tell us some things about reality. But ultimately, when I want to know what the truth is, and I want to know what reality is, I have to go to the one who made it. God created reality. God made the universe. He says what is. He created it with certain parameters. He created it with certain rules. And he revealed it to us in his word. So when he speaks in his word, it's true. When he says something in his word, it is the most loving thing possible for God is love. And when we disagree with what God says in his word, we are not being loving. We're affirming something that is evil. We're not affirming what is good. When we affirm God's word, we affirm good. The third point in a culture where truth and reality itself are under attack, the church upholds, defends, and protects the truth. Matthew A. Poole, in his commentary on the Holy Bible, he says, it isn't that the church is the foundation for the truth, because God is the foundation for the truth, but the church holds up the truth so the world can see it. Pillars also were of ancient use to fasten upon them any public edicts, which princes or courts would have published, and exposed to the view of all. Hence, the church is called the pillar and basis or seal of truth because by it the truths of God are published, supported, and defended. I am thankful to be in a church where we don't... I'm thankful. That's not part of the quote anymore. I just wrote this. I, am, I, I have to look at the closed quotes here. I am thankful to be in a church... I'm thankful to be in a church where we don't follow fashions or trends that our foundation is the Word of God and what He says. I'm thankful to have a pastor who's not afraid to speak what is true, even if it's unpopular. And guys, all of us, how will people, how will our children know what is true if everything they hear is just from the world and nobody says, stop? We have to prepare them for this stuff. We have to prepare them because they're going to hear it. If they go to public school, if they go to colleges, they're going to hear, they're going to be indoctrinated. Everyone around them, and I say everyone, 99% are going to all be saying these things because they get canceled if they say something different. And everyone's going to be just nodding their heads. Yeah, this is true. And they're going to get sucked into it. You have to prepare them. You have to teach them about this nonsense early, which means you have to understand it. You have to know what it's about. And you have to be able to like prepare them. So when, then when they hear it, they're like, Oh yeah, I heard this before. Yeah, I expected this. It's not something new that they're learning that everything their parents and their grandparents and their families told them and the church told them was wrong and they're learning the real truth when they're getting brainwashed in college when we give these colleges our money to teach our kids to hate God. <sighs> oh yeah. Was that, was that, was that, was that clear? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So those are the three things, three of the things that how God prioritizes the church and says that the church is so important. You're a vital part of the body of Christ, that it reveals God's wisdom to the world, and it, is, it upholds, defends, and protects the truth. So here are three ways we personally, you personally, me personally, we can prioritize the church in our lives. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 to 25.
Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another. How do we do that if we're not together? Let us think of ways to motivate one another. Now I forgot. Uh, okay. Oh, I found it. To acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We need to not neglect our meeting together. Pastor Will uh, gave me a great analogy, and so he's probably used, um, well, he must have used it before. But if you think of church as like a boxer, a boxer goes out and he fights for three minutes, three minutes really hard, and you think three minutes is short, but three minutes is long when you're doing a plank or you're doing, you know, hard exercise or things like that. So he's out there, and then the bell rings, and he goes into his corner, and he goes into his corner for two things. He gets rest, and he gets coaching. That's what church is. It's rest from the struggles of the world. It recharges our spiritual batteries so we could go back out and fight those battles, and we get great uh, coaching by the preaching of the Word. The first point in this section is attend regularly as a priority in your life. And I don't know, put it in your family calendar. Attend as a priority in your life. That Sunday, coming to church every Sunday, and Pastor Will said this because I used to visit my parents in Vermont, and then when we would go for a weekend, we wouldn't go to church because, you know, we were in Vermont. We weren't in Wallingford, and this is our church. And Pastor Will said something like, I think he said, I could count the times on one hand that I've ever missed church. If I go to Indy, if I, wherever he goes, he finds a church and he goes to it. And I said, you know, we found a church in Vermont and it's you know, not that far. And so when we go and visit my parents in Vermont, we go to a church there, it's like 20 minutes from their house. So you know, it makes it very easy. So now I can say, well, after the first many years ago, you know, we go to church every chance. When Luke and I went to Dallas, to Mecca, to the Holy Land of AT&T Stadium, what did we do Saturday night, Luke? We went to church. Actually, the church of the pastor, uh, Robert Morris, who's doing the uh, growth group series that we're doing. And he actually taught on the same topic. It was pretty cool. That's what kind of like maybe notice him. Um, but when you put something in your family calendar, so we all share a calendar. And so we all know what each other's doing and everything like that. And so we don't plan events that override other events. Church is a priority. Coming to church is a priority. I mean, my son Andrew is a phenomenal swimmer. All their swim meets are on Saturdays and Sundays. Well, guess what? He swims Saturdays. He doesn't swim Sundays. You know, it's, it's not a big deal because church is more important than swimming. And I think if I, show, if I demonstrate otherwise, if I, if I, you know, we go to swim meets on Sunday. I mean, we're going next Sunday, but we'll still be in church the first service. But... Um, when we, if we skip church to go to swim meets and Andrew grows up, what is he going to learn about the priority of church? The other things are more important. We have to realize what we're teaching our children uh, by our attendance in church and by people around us and how important that is. So when we put it in our family calendar, we say this is it. Wednesday nights at 9 o'clock in our family calendar is family devotionals because Luke works, everybody's got stuff going on. That's one time during the week Uh, We used to do it daily, but that's one time during the week that we carve out and we have a family devotionals and we pray together and all of that stuff. That means once it's in the calendar, it's in the calendar. You can't, that's like, means it's a priority. So I'm encouraging you, put church in your family calendar and prioritize that and think about there's all kinds of other things that can pull you from attending church. Don't let them do it. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 8. When... My wife and I have been through many times. I shared with you how... Oh, yeah, that's in the New Testament. (laughs) I can't talk and flip through the Bible at the same time. You know what? I'll I'll use the screen. I use the screen. Um, We struggled a lot financially many times. And there was a time when we were really struggling to make ends meet where we were getting behind on our mortgage payments. And we were like, you know, Pastor Will would preach about giving. Well, let's just read the verse. Well, I'll get to that. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. 
and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Now, he's not saying, oh, I've decided in my heart I don't want to give, so I'm not going to give. No, he's like, give, but do it cheerfully, not under pressure. Do it understanding what you're giving is doing and that it's God's money to start with. Um, so when we were really struggling financially, we went through our budget. We did Financial Peace University. Highly recommend it. Five stars. Would do it again. I've done it twice already anyway. Um, we, we've done Financial Peace University. We believed in tithing, giving 10% of our income to the church. And Pastor Will would preach on it. And, but we could not see possibly in our budget. We weren't going out to dinners. We weren't doing anything fancy. We cut the cord for the cable. You know, we were keeping everything really, really tight. And we were like, how do we do it? It doesn't, there's no money in there. And we met with the leaders of Financial Peace University and they helped us. They went through our budget and everything. And they said, you know, you guys are doing, you're doing everything right. They said, but why don't you give something? Give something and do it regularly and see what happens. And so we, we settled on, I think, like $50. I don't know whether it was weekly or biweekly. We did it faithfully. And Pastor Will preached a message. I remember this. It was at B Street. And he said, if it makes sense, if you can fit it into your budget, that's not faith. That's not faith. That's, that's living by sight and not by faith. And the Bible says, we, the righteous, shall live by faith and not by sight. That was backwards. I wasn't demonstrating that I really trusted God. If I really trusted God, I would say, I'm going to give 10%. I'm going to give, and I'm not going to, I'm going to let God handle the rest I'm going to trust him. I'm going to believe it. And if we lose because we were behind on our condo payments, if we lose our condo, we'll live somewhere else. But I would rather live somewhere else with God's blessing on my life. I would rather believe God can do more in my life with 90% than I could do with 100% because I already showed what I could do with 100% with a bankruptcy and a foreclosure. And I, we said, we're just going to do it. And ever since that moment, we have not stopped our condo payments got caught up. We got a loan modification, so we were able to make everything work. And, you know, I, our finances actually got better because we trusted God. I cannot, this is probably out of all of these things, and yes, giving may be like a hard thing to hear sometimes, but God says it. So, and I have lived it. I cannot tell you how, how important, how good it is to give generously I don't know, did I say the point? No, number two. Demonstrate that you really trust God and give cheerfully, sacrificially, and generously. Giving should cost us something. It shouldn't just be out of the extra. And giving in uh, Malachi chapter three it is actually a test of our faith. God tells the Jews, he says, test me in this. He's like, you're robbing me because you're not giving me your tithes. And he says, test me in this. Do it. Trust me and see if I won't open the windows of heaven and bless you with more than you can even contain. This isn't like an automatic thing. Oh, I write a check for $1,000. Then the next day, God's, it's not a pyramid scheme. It's not a Ponzi scheme. It's not an automatic thing. Listen, God saved my marriage. He gave me... He's given me more than I can even express. Two amazing children, a good life. How could I outgive God? What is that worth in money? Giving is a chance for us to put our money where our mouth is. I praise God. I raise my hands. I worship Him with my words. That doesn't cost me anything except time, right? And the ears of the John or whoever's sitting in front of me. But it shows, it, I truly believe, I cannot tell you, I truly believe, it, it's so true that God will meet all my needs. Amen. I believe it. Matthew chapter 6, you know, Jesus says, don't worry, you know, be, don't be like, you know, flower, the, God takes care of the flowers, the lilies of the field, he takes care of the birds of the air. He cares about us so much more. He will meet everything we need. We shouldn't, yes, we worry about money. I know, I get it. I'm there sometimes. It's a struggle. But I, I trust God. Do you trust God? Prove it. He can do more with what we have than you can do with what you have. Trust Him. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. Okay, fine. 
I know, I know where it is. I'll do sword drills with any of you. All right, God has given each of you a gift from his wide variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ, all glory and power to him forever and ever. And this kind of takes us back to the very first point at the top, that the church being the body of Christ, God has given us spiritual gifts, um, and we do it to lift each other up, to build the body, and to glorify God. And so the third point is this, serve faithfully in the church. Listen, this is what it means to be all in for God, is being all in for his church. There's no distinction, there's no separation, there's no dysfunction between the two. If you're all in for God, you're all in for his church, which means attending, which means giving sacrificially, faithfully, and cheerfully, and generously, uh, and serving faithfully in the church. Find a place in the church, and I said this at the beginning, find a place. There, look at the back of your connection card, and if you're just coming on Sunday, and we're, it's great that you're coming on Sunday, that's the start, but get involved. I shared the story of Shelby and I getting involved with youth ministry and, and other ministries and serving. Man, it is a joy to cook burgers, hundreds of burgers for cash out, working with other new lifers, smiling and serving people. And there's so many things you can sign up for at New Life Church, so many places that need help. And I remember this is before the merger, but they used to have a sign in South Maryland that said 0% unemployment. Everybody should be involved. When you're served, you're plugged into the church. You're getting involved in the ministries of the church, and there's so many places that could use your help. Uh, one, is the <coughs> one is the Grace Place Food Pantry. We serve thousands of families in Meriden Food. What a wonderful thing. And they could use help because a lot of the work they do in lifting boxes and things like that is during the day when, you know, no offense, younger people generally work and retired people are available. So my uh, 72... What, how old's your dad? 72? 73-year-old father-in-law, and a bunch of his friends are there like loading heavy boxes and stuff. You know, they could use help, so that would be something great to sign up for. If it's not on the connection card, you could write it in the blanks underneath. They'll contact you and tell you how you can serve. Um, kids ministry, youth ministry, you have to be members of the church to serve in those um, and go through a background check. Uh, a growth group leaders, you have to be a member of the church to serve in that, but we need more growth groups Growth groups have been such a blessing. I never wanted people in my home. My anti-gift was probably mercy, and probably even over that was hospitality. My home was my place. I don't want people coming here. This is me, my, my safe space. And Pastor Paul, way back when, said, hey, will you do a growth group? I'm like, fine, okay. So we do one. I think there was like one session in the last like 30 that we haven't done a growth group. We love doing growth groups. So um, you know, that's, that's a step of faith sometimes. I think you think, oh, I have to have the Bible memorized. I have to know all this and that. No, do a growth group. If you're a member of the church, you can do it. Um, help for events, needs that come up, things like that. Those are all things that we can do. Listen, you may not know the blessing that awaits you until you try. Try. Trust God. Here's today's takeaway. How you prioritize the church in your life has a powerful impact, not only in your own life, but on generations to come. Put your church first by faithful attendance, giving, and serving. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of serving you, of serving your kingdom of serving our community and our church, God, of giving all the things. You've blessed us in so many ways, God. Help us to think and be thankful for all the blessings you poured out in our lives and not just look at what we don't have or comparing ourselves to people who have more. God, we have you. There is nothing greater. Nothing is greater than you. It's a song. God, we just love you. We praise you. I pray that you help every single person here, myself included, to just demonstrate more faithfulness to you, God, by loving your church. We love you, we praise you, and thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for watching. If you would like to support any of the ministries that we have here at New Life, you can give at newlifechurchct.com. And while you're there, you can check on all of the upcoming events that we have here at the church. Also, you can download our New Life Church CT app. And don't forget to follow us on social media so you can stay connected and see some behind the scenes of New Life Church. 
Again, thank you for watching and have an amazing week.